Well, good evening and welcome to our underwater photography webinar. My name is Emily Watts and I am the Stream Team Coordinator for the City of Lacey. Stream Team is part of an environmental education partnership sponsored by the storm and surface water utilities of the cities of Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater, as well as Thurston County. As you may already know, polluted stormwater runoff has a negative impact on our entire ecosystem. In fact, the majority of pollution reaching Puget Sound is carried when rain washes things such as oil, grease, bacteria from pet waste, and yard chemicals into storm drains, which can end up untreated in our local waters. Studies show that pollutants in stormwater are harmful to human health, shellfish, drinking water, and our local waterways. Jacqueline is here today to illuminate us on some of those species that depend on clean water in Puget Sound. If you're interested in learning about how you can help keep pollution out of stormwater runoff, I encourage you to visit our website at streamteam.info. If you have questions during Jacqueline's presentation, please click the Q&A button and type in your question, which we'll be answering at the end of the presentation. This evening, we're delighted to share with you Jacqueline's beautiful photography, including those she's taken underwater and get to hear about her experiences with the species found under the surface of Puget Sound. Now I'll hand it over to Michelle and Jacqueline to introduce themselves and begin the program. Thanks, Emily. This is, I'm Michelle Stevie. I am the Senior Habitat Biologist for City of Olympia and the Stream Team Coordinator. And we're really happy to have Jacqueline here tonight. So welcome, Jackie. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Jacqueline Winter. I've been a cold water scuba diver for going on over 11 years now. Um, have all my dives here in Puget Sound and well, further on going on to the Salish Sea up into Nanaimo area a little bit. Um, I have a degree in art for environmental education from the Evergreen State College. Um, where, um, and then I've, the last couple of years, I've been a uh, field scientist doing data collection on a variety of projects, um, either through Fish and Wildlife or Department of Ecology. Um, this presentation that I, um, that I revamped a little bit for you guys, um, called Creatures of the Deep, uh, has been shown to numerous, um, ed numerous children um, through Nisqually Reach Nature Center um, here in Olympia, Washington. Um, and uh, just adjusted it a little bit for you guys to show a little bit more of the habitat and um, just get, you know, a different, uh, get a different landscape, you know, we're all kind of stuck in our homes. So, so um, I guess I'm gonna go share my screen here and get this going. So, Creatures of the Deep. Um, so, I'm going to talk about um, just basically what you see down there. Um, here in this photo, we have a uh, sea, we have a sea slug, and we have a wolf eel. These are two things that we see a lot in Puget Sound. There will be more images of these two creatures um, further on in the presentation. Um, Okay, so here's a picture of me. I don't, I probably have like three pictures of me underwater. I obviously did not take this photo. Um, this was taken in Hood Canal. So uh, every time you go diving, you should have a dive buddy. I mean, there's obviously some um, exceptions, um, extended training if you're going to dive alone. Um, so this is about five feet away from my dive buddy. Um, and that's usually what we're comfy with. Um, if you notice, um, I am what we call trimmed out. So that's basically uh, my profile in the water. And that's just to become more dynamic um, as far as like reducing drag in the environment and reducing sediment. So I have my legs up, I have my feet up so that I don't kick sediment off of uh, the ground or rocks. Um, we have very silty waters in the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, so I got this camera here. Um, I no longer do underwater photography. I actually have not been scuba diving in almost a full year. So that's a, you know, you can always think uh, there'll always be tomorrow to go scuba, scuba diving, but um, I put it off too long and now um, hopefully I'll get into the waters here soon. I do have scuba gear ready to go in my garage. 
Um, for the most part, I used a low-cost camera with a wide-angle lens and dual strobes. Um, I used the strobes to get around the sediment that's in the water column. You will notice um, some edited and unedited photos throughout the presentation, um, and you'll be, those are pretty um, distinguished, you can tell. So challenges of underwater photography. So we have lots of sediment in our waters. We have very nutrient waters. Um, and so we have a lot of death and decay that falls and filters of marine snow. We have this biomatter. So um, one challenge being the amount of light that we have in the environment and also the amount of sediment. So using those strobes, um, so this is the forward, fast, forward flash strobe and it's, um, getting a lot of backscatter. Uh, so here is a comb jelly. It's called a cat's eye comb jelly. Uh, this is about the size of a pea. Um, I used it with my macro lens to the picture. Uh, you can see all the particulate matter in the photo frame, uh, edited photo. I would actually meticulously go through and remove all these little specks. I actually had done that and then I didn't save the file. So this is less, you know, you can spend 10 hours editing a good photo if you really want to have it. Um, I've known people to do that. I haven't spent 10 hours on editing one photo though. Um, so here we have um, a red octo. Um, it's one of a few species of octopus that we have in Puget Sound. Um, so this particular guy, I, it was found in um, Grandondo Beach off of, um, by the MAST Marine Science Center uh, in Des Moines, Washington. Um, another challenge that we have in the underwater environment is movement of animals. So this uh, picture here is a screenshot of a spiny dogfish. Um, you just can't, without a high speed camera, it's really hard to get those guys um, in frame. And here's another example of uh, missing the moment. So we have a red octopus here that's using its jet propulsion and um, if you can see in the corner there that's its ink cloud. This is also at Redondo Beach in Des Moines. We have a lot of um, debris there in that area to form habitat and it's known as a dive, a very popular dive site up there. So with the PVC piping and um, little critters will be found there. We have a Stimson star, Plumos an enemy, and a red rock crab in this shot. Uh, but also when things are moving really fast, you might get a shot that you didn't expect to get. So this shot was done in the Hood Canal. Um, unfortunately, me and my dive buddy uh, disturbed a giant Pacific octopus. It was probably one of the most, uh, like, I wouldn't say it was aggressive, but it was definitely defensive behavior on the part of an octopus. Um, we were running up to this pinnacle, or basically a rock pile, um, and we were on scooters, so the, we're pretty sure the noise disturbed this particular octopus, and as it was fleeing, it, um, I caught this picture of its arm. Uh, okay. okay, here's a picture of a species of jellyfish. I would you know, normally go to say that it was a moon jelly, but because the tentacles were so much longer on this and didn't have the clover-like markings of a moon jelly, that's why I took a picture. Um, I have over 600 dives, so I usually don't take pictures of things I see all the time. So I'm like, oh, that's a little different, and then maybe try to come home and look in my ID guide and see, oh, this is not in yours and usually seen in this area. Um, this is seen floating um, above eelgrass beds. Um, we have eelgrass beds throughout Puget Sound. Um, they are one of our crucial habitats that we have. Uh, we have two different types of eelgrass. There is a native eelgrass that uh, grows a little bit deeper than um, the sh a smaller or shorter growing species of eelgrass um, that was introduced from Japan. Um, but they all produce their O2 produce, 
produce oxygen. Um, they provide 3D, 3D habitat. Um, they are useful because they protect um, shores by slowing waves, uh, slowing the wave action. Um, despite being called eelgrass, they're actually not a grass. They are related to um, lilies, and they're in the lily family. Okay, and the more eelgrass. Here we have um, some algae or epiphytes growing on the eelgrass. Um, something that people are concerned about with climate change, we're going to have more algae blooms, um, but we don't know exactly because there's so much um, food chain dynamics between grazers and um, predator-prey relationships. So um, maybe animals will have a way to adapt to that. Um, amphipods, so if you go to the beach, those little, uh, some people call them sand fleas, um, you'll see these, they'll actually um, prolific grazers of this algae. Okay. And then we have another kelp. We have, this is another habitat. Um, this is in Titlow Beach um, at the um, just west of the Narrows Bridge at the end of the presentation. I have a photo of this de de dive site. Uh, again, that's called Titlow Beach. Uh, so kelp is also one of those hazards for a diver. Basically, we just have to know that they could tangle us up um, more. It's, um, I've had my fin get caught on it, but I just, you know, had to use like the main thing when you're diving is you're just always calm. So if you're not calm, then bad things happen. So just take your time and then I just untangle myself. Um, okay. And then we have pilings. Uh, these giant plumose anemones um, are on most pilings around. Um, you can also see some algae and kelp growing on there. Um, this particular piling is probably from Chitlow Beach area as well. Okay. So then we, um, so we have very muddy and sandy South Sound. So if you go down here in Olympia, we have people are like, where do you dive down here? And I was like, not many places because it's just mud and sand. As you go further north, um, like the, again, this is um, Tacoma area. This is off of, um, this is actually Point Defiance area. And we have more rocky structures um, and therefore more life. So here's a red octopus on a boulder and there's some cobble and sand. Um, and then there's a chitin, which um, is related to snails and octopus um, to the left of that octopus. Okay, another uh, great thing about diving is when I come home, I can like relive my dive and see things that I might've not seen before. So I shoot blindly often. So to get the chance to maybe see something that I didn't. So that usually means I'm not looking into my viewfinder. I'm not even pay attention where I'm shooting. I just make sure I'm still and I'm not um, push, putting up sediment. Um, you can see some sediment in this picture. I don't know if you guys can rec uh, see that there is a fish in this picture. Some people look at it a long time and see it never. And some people see it right away. Um, it's in the left hand top corner there. And there's also some tube worms underneath it. Um, this is also a Point Defiance wall. So if you've ever been to Point Defiance and wondered what it looks like underwater, well, it's a lot of clay vertical walls um, and it changes a lot because there's a lot of current there. Um, all these, lots of shellfish will, um, drill into these clay walls and I have names for like this one was called the pizza slice or the cheesecake I don't remember it's been a long time since I did there but that's the way we you know have fun when we're diving give names to the places that we're at um, this here is also on point defiance wall this is a kelp green lane this is a female um, they are one of the more difficult fishes to take a picture of in Puget Sound because they are very dirty um, and they're a lot more shy than other fish. Sometimes 
fish will just swim right up to you. These fish, I have never have, have that happen. Um, so this is the female. Uh, they get about two feet long. The male um, are blue and they're found in rocky areas. Um, so this is a, in the sandstone cliff. This is a vertical column that was carved out and it was high current and this fish is just kind of tucked in resting. Uh, again, this is point defiance wall. This is more of the hard clay set structure. Uh, this is a probably a giant, a small giant Pacific octopus, also known as a GPO. Um, and there's various hermit crabs and sharp nosed crab, I believe, and snails um, throughout, um, filling up the uh, filling up every nook and cranny. Um, again, again, this is point defiance. Um, this is in the same clay wall. We have a uh, blue top snail and a red Irish lord. Uh, red, um, a red Irish lord is a type of sculpin, by the way. Um, another clay wall. So you can look at the sand granules here for scale. This was a macro shot that I used. Um, and this is uh, off of Rustin Way in front of the lobster shop restaurant. And there is a shrimp species, may potentially a dock, dock, dock shrimp, or a, also known as a coon stripe shrimp. Um, this is the top of Point Defiance Wall, and there's some some. There's some bivalves. Sorry, I got distracted for a second there. Um, here we have scallops. These um, are another type of bivalve. Um, those little black dot dots are its eyes. Uh, they can be free swimming. Um, rock scallops are a cemented scallop that we have in Puget Sound. I do not have a picture of them. Um, this is off of Z's Reef. Um, Z's Reef is located southwest of Tacoma and um, that was on a boat dive. So it's on a Z's Reef, this wall that takes about maybe 10 minutes to swim one way and then we swim the top of it and then come back and swim in the bottom part. Um, and then that usually takes up a good 45 minute dive. It's usually average what um, our scuba dives used to be. And you can see there the background, that is truly the color you see when you are underwater. Um, all right, then uh, another habitat to mention, one of my favorite is called cloud sponges. This particular one is taken in Hood Canal. Um, cl cloud sponges are located uh, at a depth of usually starting around 100 feet. I have no, found them in locations in the 70s, but those are going to be on those extreme tides. So when we go, if our mission is like we want to go take pictures of some cloud sponges, we're probably going to design that d dive around the tides and making sure that we can be down longer. So therefore we're using less um, air in our, from our tanks and we can um, be down there longer. Uh, this is a lingcod, and there is a lingcod egg mass. You can also see some sharp-nosed crabs. Um, I have some more pictures of cloud sponges later in the presentation as well. Um, we have this pipeline that this giant Pacific octopus is hiding under. This is in Stillicum. Uh, there's a beach called Sunnyside. And it's a great beginner dive site because you don't go too deep. Um, it's not too current sensitive. And you can see a lot of uh, animals in a short dive, short uh, radius from the entry point of your dive. It's a lot of locals learn to dive there. Those are usually their first dives at Sunnyside. And you can usually tell there's a crab by, you can tell by the crab mess outside of uh, any area that there might be an octopus there. So you see part of a crab leg. Here's a, a little red octopus that's taken advantage of its uh, some garbage. Um, I often find 
different animals inside of bottles, whether they're uh, eel-like creatures or small fish or octopus. This is an unedited one because you can see all the marine scatter. Um, you can tell um, it's a G, um, the GPO versus a red octopus because they have these little protrusions on their eyes. The red octopus also get uh, don't get large like the GPO. They get no bigger than usually about the size of a basketball. Great. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't. All right. All right, here we have a stubby squid. Um, if you can guess what that object is on the left, that is a golf ball. So stubby squids um, bury themselves in the sediment during the day and come out at night to feed. You can see the barnacles on that golf ball for scale as well. And you can see that they're in the process of changing colors. Um, they can also look like this. Um, off of Rustin Way in Tacoma, I've seen several of them, but I've seen a few in Hood Canal as well. Um, then I got sea whips. So sea whips are probably one of my favorite places to go see besides the um, cloud sponges, not only because they're deep, but um, they're just so unique and alien looking. Um, so you can see in this picture, I'm using a little bit of ambient light. Um, we try to shoot upwards to get some natural light because it's so dang dark and down there. And then I have, on this particular picture, it looks like I might only have my right strobe on. And you can see that um, coming from the side. Um, but it's really hard to get landscape pictures uh, here just because the amount of, the lack of light and, the uh, amount of sediment. Um, and then up close, this is what they look like. So the sea whips will get, um, they can be about 10 feet tall. Um, no, that's not right. I think about six feet tall. They're about the size of me. Um, and then um, they are eaten by pre tritonias, which are a type of sea slugs. Um, they're known as an octocoral, so they're a polyp with eight tentacles. There we go. Um, and there's two species. There's one that usually grows in the shallower. Um, this is the larger species. Um, I've only seen two or three of the smaller species in the shallows. And these grow starting at about 65 feet deep. And then we got plumus and enemies. So this is a common sight when you go scuba diving, a wall with plumos and enemies and kelp maybe covering the rocky um, substrate below. Um, this is at a site in Hood Canal. Um, these plumos and enemies can get several feet long and they can live up to 200 years. Um, they eat. Uh, they're filter feeders. You can actually still use, the, it looks like they're feeding, they're putting the hands in their mouth, their oral disc. Um, I've actually seen them eating uh, lion's mane jellyfish, so they're reeling in, them in and they reincorporate the stinging cells into their body for protection. Uh, here's a red rock crab. Um, this was taken in the Squally Reach uh, area outside of Anderson Island. Um, we were doing some exploratory diving, uh, just trying to see presence and absence of life because you don't, can't protect something if you don't know what's down there. So we've done numerous uh, exploratory dives through the Nisqually Reach Nature Center. Um, this is a core sediment uh, sampling device that we tried to get some core samples to um, evaluate biologics that could be in the sand. Um, we ended up finding out a lot of our samples did not have very many biologics, um, mainly because uh, there's a lot of turnover, there's a lot of sediment loading in, um, in the Nisqually Delta from the Nisqually River. Um, it was a fun interaction. It was a little annoying and distraction, distracting. Obviously, when you're diving, you know, just fun distraction could easily become 
you know, a dangerous distraction. So it's always like, you know, don't get too wrapped up in fighting the crab over your sample. Um, and we have salmon. So salmon, I, one of our most important uh, resources here in Washington state, both of these salmon, um, they're about two and four inches in size. The, they were found in either um, Chitlow Beach and the other one I saw in Hood Canal. Um, so these two to four inch salmon end up will one day hopefully become, you know, what we would like to be 60 pound plus salmon, but um, average on a sa adult salmon is about 30 pounds, 24 to 36 versus, um, we have the record was 97 pounds. Um, for sport fishermen and 126 pounds for commercial um, and that 126 was in 1949 in Alaska. Okay we have a ratfish. So uh, ratfish related to sharks. Um, they use a figure eight um, motion when they swim and they are highly reflective so when I shine my high-powered uh, dive light on them on their eyes you actually get a radiating beam of light that reflects out outside um, away from it which is pretty cool especially if you're in a school of these and you have multiple diversions so you just have like all these little like laser beams all over the place reflecting from their eyes they do have a spine on the top of their dorsal spine um, but um, never heard of anyone being injured from them um, they like eating shellfish these, um, this particular guy was found off of Maury Island um, around some pilings and all of that debris on the bottom is um, barnacles um, and they, they were doing some pe uh, piling removal and um, not normal to see, this is like a, just a different substrate than I normally see so that's why I thought this was a good picture. Um, right. So everybody likes octopus, so I made sure I put a few of those in here. All right, so um, this one found at Day Island Wall off of Tacoma. Um, and that's west of Tacoma. Um, you can see that their skin um, has unique textures. Later on, there'll be more pictures. You can see the um, variety of um, color and textures um, and they can contort and lengthen their body. Um, they uh, have color changing cells. Um, they're basically what I told them the octopus are basically mucus and sensory cells. Um, they have um, their chromatophores or their, are their um, color changing cells. Uh, uh, this guy here I called Snuggles. So Snuggles was found off of Redondo Beach and was quite a distraction. So you can see the slant of the of the hillside there. That is basically how steep I was. Um, so th this particular site, it gets deep really quick. So being distracted by snuggles, I stayed deep a little bit longer than I should have. Um, luckily, I always plan for, um, I have a little bit of redundancy in my dive plan. So I have extra air and um, I may take extra safety stops or basically um, off gassing. So when I dive, um, you only can be down so deep. Uh, there's a rule of thumb, you can be down 60 feet for 50 minutes and 50 feet for 60 minutes. Um, that's just doing math in my head. Um, when you're diving, you actually have a dive computer that's real time analyzing um, those numbers for you so that you don't um, have anything bad happen to you. So, and at the bottom of this you, uh, picture, you see there's a sunflower star. Uh, there'll be several pictures throughout the rest of this slideshow that you'll see um, a little photo bomb of uh, this guy. Uh, we have a wolf eel here. Um, it's a, one of the largest attractions to scuba diver is finding wolf eels. They are not wolf eels. Uh, I mean, they're not eels. Um, they are actually related to gunnels. Um, they have, um, uh, here we have spot 
prawns. So this is like the coveted two day fishing season in the canal to get your spot prawns. Um, they have a very short season. Um, but when you, when I go diving, you can just see eyes for as long as the darkness carries. Um, this little light will reflect off their eyes. Um, with this picture, obviously you can only illuminate so much. And you think you can catch them? No, nah, you can't just grab them. They, they're, they're tricky. Um, here is a coonstripe shrimp or a dock shrimp. Okay, and it's um, uh, these are some orange crust bryozoans, um, and he's he, this little dude's on some, some species of sponge. Um, bryozoans are also known as mass animals, and uh, lots of species of sea slugs like to browse on those. So um, you'll see those later on. Here we have a decorator crab on sea lettuce. Um, again, you can see how much uh, debris we have in our water column. The decorator shrimp, or I'm sorry, the decorator crab has these Velcro-like appendages on them uh, that they can use material from their surrounding environment to help them blend in. So I've seen pieces of plastic on them. I've seen pieces of nudibranch eggs on them. I've seen different types of seaweed glued to them. So um, there's a lot of diversity of um, decorator crabs out there. Okay. All right. Um, and then we have a giant barnacle here. So giant barnacles are just really amazing because after they die, they become shelter. So this is um, off of Point Defiance, you can see a little red octopus in making home of one of those uh, shells. Um, also, different species of fish also hide in there. So when we go out diving, we just kind of, we're always like looking under rocks and sticking our heads from, you know, sticking our heads where maybe other people wouldn't stick their heads. But the good thing to know about here in Puget Sound, there's nothing that can harm us. We don't have any, aggressive, poisonous animals to hurt ourselves here. Okay. And then this is a close-up of the giant barnacle. So this is with a macro lens. They um, feed with their feet. Um, they are, when they are young and they're planktonic, they're free floating, and then they find something, uh, then they basically cement themselves, cement their head to wherever they're going to live the rest of their lives. Um, here we have a helmet crab. Helmet crabs are found in the shallows of South Sound area. Again, this is another animal that I found in the Nisqually Aquatic Reserve. Um, not, uh, not something that people eat. It's not even on, um, well, right now there's no harvesting of crab, no recreational crab harvesting. We have here, we have an ochre star. And what I thought might be a Dungeness crab, but it might be a grateful, graceful crab. There's not a lot of Dungeness, and with by the, the size, I would say it's a graceful crab. Um, these ochre stars, they come in orange and purple. Uh, they're still the same species. Um, they um, did get hit really bad with the sea star wasting disease um, that has basically a virus in association with different environmental conditions have stressed out the animals to the point where they are dying. There are some, seem to be some populations in different areas that are more resilient, but the problem with sea stars are really hard to track long-term. You can't put a tracking device in a sea star because they have a water vascular system and they'll just remove that tag. They don't, it doesn't belong on them, they know it. Um, here's um, a ochre star on a piling. And you can see the barnacles that got scraped off, probably, probably. 
And so here are some sunflower stars. So these are the ones, these are the stars that have been most decimated in our Puget Sound region due to the wasting disease. Um, they came in the orange and blues and purples. Um, they could be about two feet across, have 24 feet. Um, this is on a wall in Hood Canal where at any time you, I mean, I, it would just be one after another, after another, after another, you could count dozens and dozens on a dive. Now I go on a dive well, as of a year ago and two years ago and three years ago, you maybe only see one or two here and there if you're lucky on a dive. Um, but it does look like they, so there are some resilient communities. All right, here's another sunflower star on some kelp and this is in the aquatic reserve. This particular one taken in 2016 um, so we were like, ooh, there's still sun stars. So that was in the middle of it going down, the population going down. Um, so now here we have some diversity of sea stars. Um, we have the yellow one that's a wrinkled star and it feeds on spongy, sponges and hydrocorals. We have a morning sun star, which preys on other sea stars. Uh, there's a, there is a, another golf ball for com size comparison. And then we have a Stimson's or a striped star. Um, those can be purple, blue, um, red, and orange. Um, and those are intertidal to 2,000 feet. Uh, intertidal meaning basically low tide to high tide, or low, high tide to subtidal zone. And here we have a spiny red star, um, orange sea pins, which will be, have some sea pins photos coming up soon, um, are its food as well as anemones. And then there is a urchin, which is a relative to the sea star. Um, they're both econoderms, uh, basically means they have spiny skin and two feet, um, what unites them. This particular urchin is a green urchin, even though it looks pink, um, but it's what we call the green. We have purple, red, and green, this being the smallest of the species that we have in our area. And this is what we call the diver's nemesis. This is called a lion's mane. Um, basically, most things that divers complain about are getting stung on the face by these guys. Um, and you can recognize by their lobed mantle and usually their bright colors. They come from anything bright purple, neon pink. Here's another shot of a lion's mane jelly. There you can see its lobe mantle or bell. Um, and in the background that's sargassum weed or fireweed. Uh, it's introduced from Japan um, and that grows um, up to 16 feet deep. And it's usually about nine feet long. And here's another one. Um, I would probably not be so up close, but this was actually a dying lion's mane. You can see that there's no uh, tentacles, long tentacles trailing. It's just drifting along. Uh, here's that sea pen I was telling you about. Um, sea pens are, um, they have a green fluorescence when they're disturbed. Um, this was found in the aquatic reserve. And then here's a picture of a baby sea pen. So very similar to those sea whips. Um, and then here is what's called a shaggy mouse. This is a type of sea slug. This is just going to be a variety of sea slugs. This is a, what's called a Dord species, a Dorona species, a Dinger noted species, and more Dords. This is called a Rufus Dinger noted, the Gold Dorona, Clown Dored. Here's another shaggy mouse. Um, 
uh, which got photobombed by a piece of plankton. So these are some small barnacles, and I just that was just uh, a happy occurrence just to see something that when you put your photos into an editing software and you don't expect to get that. Um, more Dorid, another Dorid for uh, species diversity here. Um, he's from Hermacinda species, and they are feeding on sponges and bryozoans. Uh, here we have grunt sculpins. They are doing a courtship here dance. They were running around. They're a type of fish. They just kind of hop along. People say they do grunt. I've never heard them grunt. Um, this is called a red brotula. It is a fairly cryptic animal. Um, this was taken at a night dive. Uh, we have the spiny lump sucker. And he's just in eelgrass there, camouflaged. We have a painted greenling here, and there's another sunflower star. Painted greenling is camouflaged right there in the middle of the picture. Um, and then we have a lot of rockfish here. We have um, 30, 62 species off our west coast. Here are some more cloud sponges. Um, so the cloud sponges, come back to those, um, they are nearly made out of glass. Um, they're silica animals. Um, they look like distorted vase-like creatures. Um, very Dr. Seuss, depending on the amount of sediment or light or current, they grow into different formations. So they can be more horizontal or more vertical, depending on their um, location. Um, and they, um, they're an extraordinary filter feeder. They filter about 10 times their body volume each hour. So if that is true, that would make them one of the most efficient vacuums of the sea. Um, there are these ancient reefs up in Canada that are known to be over 5,000 years old. Um, and then the young will grow on the broken parent material that has broken off, which is good because uh, sometimes we know have seen divers accidentally kick and break these beautiful things, but it's good to know that they will be the base for a new uh, colony. Some more rockfish. This is a tiger rockfish. This is a decorated war bonnet. They, this will usually be found in rocks and they're on the uh, rocky bottoms. And a mossy headed war bonnet. And a gunnel, I mentioned gunnels earlier being related to wolf eels. I'm watching the time <laughs> here. So um, here's uh, another wolf eel. This is a juvenile wolf eel again, and there's another photo bomb of that sunflower star in the background. Um, nowadays, if I were to go diving, there would not be that many sun stars in all my pictures. Um, and there's a scaly head sculpin on the bottom left hand corner. There's snuggles again. I believe the divers in the area might have fed him and that what made him so affectionate. This is a young adult, again with the sunflower star. And here's a mated pair. We got the female on the left. Uh, you can notice the giant barnacle there. Um, they mate for life. Um, but a lot of times when you're diving, this is maybe all you see of a wolf eel. It's very rare to see them f fully swimming outside of their dens. And they all have unique markings. So some of them will be missing teeth or they'll have these scars. I've seen ones that were missing part of their tails or even missing eyes. You really see their war wounds. And of course, I left octopus for the last of the end of the slides. Um, here is a giant Pacific octopus literally resting on the top of a wall before drop off. Just look, it looked a lot more like a rock when I first saw it. 
Um, here's a GPO in a rock crevice, trying to blend in with its surroundings. And there is a rock. The rockfish are not as uh, shy as other fish. This particular octopus was, um, I believe, in the throes of starting some kind of courtship. It was, there was another octopus in the vicinity. I've never had any other experience where two octopuses were out and about chasing each other. So he was trying to get under that boulder, or she was trying to get under that boulder. Um, and then that's um, the other octopus that was outside that area, the same event. Um, there's a giant barnacle up there at the top again. And you can see a scar on this particular giant Pacific octopus. This is at Day Island Wall, Tacoma. Again, that's the same octopus as here. So you can see their color transitions. This particular guy, I called him Space Octo because he looked like he was floating in outer space, but then I edited all the space out of him. So um, he was uh, just running past us on a night dive and that's uh, the lucky shot I ended up getting. Um, this one I called Moldy Octo because I kind of thought he looked moldy and he was, he looked, healthy, but I have not usually seen this much of a like gray um, coloration on an octopus before. Uh, and here we have a giant Pacific octopus aerating her eggs in a den. And you can see a single egg laying on the side there. All right. So that's basically concludes the, my presentation tonight. Um, here's that picture of Titlow Beach. Um, it's a great place to go. Uh, you have to cross the train tracks. Many times I've loaded up in scuba gear just to have to wait for the trains to pass. Um, great place to see a sunset. There'll usually be cormorants hanging out here as well. Um, but um, just, you know, basically, um, you know, Hopefully you're going to help us protect our underwater neighbors. Um, and there's many ways you can do that, but the simple ways are picking up pet waste, using a car wash. I use the car wash today for the first time in many years. Um, use alternative transportation, bike and walk whenever possible. Avoid use of harmful chemicals and try natural altern alternatives. Have your cars and septic systems routinely checked. Pack it in, pack it out mentality when you go out in nature uh, because all streams lead to the ocean and uh, just letting only rain down the drain. So that's again why we insist on car washes so you're not getting all that grime straight down your drains. Have some other place to be processed. Um, yeah, and um, this is... Um, Went back, way back when in college, when I took photography, we had to learn how to do different types of panoramas, and this is called a globe panorama. Um, and so this is a photo taken on um, a boat in Hood Canal, and you have the uh, Olympic Mountains there, and then the wave is the wake from the boat. So um, just, uh, yeah, that's it. That's great. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. It looks like we do have some questions. So for those of us that joined us mid-presentation, you should see a Q&A button on your screen. You can go ahead and click that and type in questions. We had one during the presentation that Michelle answered for us. Carol asked, how big are giant barnacles? And Michelle answered about four inches plus. Is that, has that been your experience, Jacqueline? Yeah, I've seen clusters of smaller ones at Titlow. Um, they actually removed the pilings at Titlow Beach and was really hoping to get some of those um, conglomerates of giant barnacles for some nature tanks like the estuarium and the Nisqually Reach Nature Center. But um, you have to have permits and we were having some problems. But those ones were about two and three inches. But I think I've seen four is the largest I've seen. And the next question, we got kind of towards the beginning. Um, she asked, are these natural wall shapes with the rectangles? You were talking about all the critters you were seeing at the wall on the walls in the beginning. 
Um, yeah, those are just broken apart. Um, it's basically there's just a crack in the earth and they'll just give way. I've been one time driving or swimming by an area. I'm like, I think that's going to give way. And you come back a couple tide cycles later and lo and behold, some land has sloughed off. And at what depth are you when you were with the sea whips? Because it was very dark, they said. So that was probably about 65 feet. Um, you lose a lot of light in the first 15 feet. Um, but that was an exceptionally good visibility day. Usually visibility can be five feet, 10 feet, a foot. And that day it was probably 30, 40 feet. So. Oh, wow. So it really depends on the conditions then. Yeah. Wonderful. How big are the sea slugs in Puget Sound? They can be um, anywhere from the size of a fingernail, a baby finger. I've seen little babies before the size of fingernail. Um, we have tritonias that are about the size of a loaf of bread. Um, and same, yeah, the tritonias, they, they're about the size of a loaf of bread. But on average, I would say about four inches. So Carol asks, I've seen crabs on the shoreline. Do all crabs also live deep underwater? So the crabs that you see on the shoreline, those are shore crabs, um, and they only are on the shore. So those species you won't find um, much deeper than what a lowest tide marking would be. Um, and they grow, I mean, they're all over the place, they, from intertidal to super deep. And Clarissa asked, do you have a favorite dive or dive spot? I did, and I can't go there anymore. So oh, no. um, it was off of Hood Canal. Um, it's actually, there's, there's always sometimes people contesting like what is public access versus these are somebody's tide lands or they're growing shellfish. So sometimes people will lease out an area and they can, you can pay to go on there. Um, but I used to dive this place called Jorsted Creek, which is just south of Hamahama. And now there's a sign that says, please ask Hamahama Oyster Company for permission. And I haven't, well, mainly also because the access to that site is also down a treacherous hill with like, there at one point was a rope to get down there, but to haul 75 plus pounds of gear down a hill and back up. Um, I did it several times and, uh, I guess it's just in that those experiences are in the past, but they were really good when I was going there on the regular. And we have a question. Are there opportunities to volunteer to support your research? Um, well, there is the Nisqually Reach Nature Center. Um, you can visit their website at nisqualiestuary.org. Um, they have a, a citizen stewardship committee meeting each month, which they recently started doing on Zoom. Um, so if you go to nisqualiestuary.org, um, there probably should be information on there. They're also on Facebook. And, and Amy asks, are you often approached by curious seals when diving? Um, not too often. I've had some bad experiences with seals, uh, mainly because there's something called narcosis. So when you dive deep, you get narcosis and that there's a lot of factors at play. It is depth, but it's also like, how healthy are you? Like how fine tuned is your body? Um, that can be anything from like, did you take any coal medicine? Did you eat well? Do you have enough calories to burn? Do you hydrate it enough? Did you get enough rest? And narcosis is also known as the martini effect. So you basically get a feeling of intoxication the deeper you go down. So I've been on a night dive on that verge of where it's like, intoxication and had seals dive bomb me and me being like narcosis can go one or two ways it can go to euphoria or it could go to fear and dread and so, so with the seals it you know for a moment I was like kind of scared but anytime you have narcosis there's a quick fix and that's you just you go a little bit shallower and sometimes it's a matter of a couple of feet um, you can dive different gas mixtures um, to avoid those things, but then there's different uh, 
elaborate training involved in those. Uh, but yeah, I've rarely been bugged on by seals. There's been a couple dives where I've maybe been a little grumpy and my dive buddy wasn't communicating with me. And so it was kind of like, it was a lot of work to have fun on this dive. And then we're doing our safety stop at 15 feet. Um, that's where we're off gassing um, just to make sure we don't have too much nitrogen in our blood system and there was a seal that just kind of came and chilled right next to me and I'm like oh I don't need to be in such a bad mood right now um, that's very cool and the last question that's listed again others feel free to type it into the Q&A um, they asked how cold is the water here did you dive year-round so um, the waters um, are pretty cold. Um, you need a dry suit. Some people dive in a wetsuit. Our waters um, are in that 50 to 60 degree range um, year round. Uh, Hood Canal being um, a little bit warmer, about five degrees on average. Um, and we also do have thermoclines um, where there's water because of uh, pressure and salinity. Um, there are areas where all of a sudden the water just gets really warm. Um, and um, so that's kind of nice. A lot of times when we're diving, uh, we'll get cold on a 45 minute dive at 60 feet, but then we get to 15 feet and it's a lot warmer. And so instead of maybe just calling it quits, we may like, okay, I've warmed up enough and then we'll hang out in that um, warmer area. So would you dive year round, Jacqueline? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. The winter is actually the best time to go diving because we have less plankton blooming, um, so we have better water quality. We also don't have as many lion's manes during mm. the winter. So during the summer, we have bad visibility. We have the lion's mane, so that keeps some people out of the water. And also when you're diving a dry suit, um, it's a fine balance between you don't want to overheat and sweat before you get in the water. So, um, cause sweat underwater in your suit is going to get cold and then you, you could be in this warm suit and still get hypothermia from your sweat. So it's like, okay, you gotta really plan things like that. Um, out. Absolutely. And Christina asks, what was your favorite thing you saw when diving? Well, one time I saw a sturgeon and that was really cool because I was like, what was that? And it was when I was a new diver and I was very much like, I can't go any deeper. I gotta, you know, stay at 60 feet. I can't go to 62 feet, but um, I didn't know what it was because it was right on that vert, the edge of that visibility. So it was like 20 feet away. And I'm like, is that a shark? Is that, what is it? So that was pretty um, exciting. And the um, event with the octopus digging, that was pretty exciting as well. Wonderful. Well, there's no other questions in the Q&A. If anybody has a last minute question they'd like to ask, go ahead and type it into that Q&A box. We'll give it just another minute or two. Um, but just like to give a really big thank you to Jacqueline for spending her time with us today and sharing all of these incredible photographs. Um, it, it's just been amazing to learn about all of these beautiful species here in Puget Sound. And she mentioned all of those wonderful actions for clean water. If you'd like to learn more detail about those, you can visit streamteam.info. That is Streamteam's website where we have a whole panel of actions for clean water and lots of resources um, if you'd like to get a little bit more information. It looks like we don't have any other questions, so I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. Again, thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, thank Michelle. You. Um, I hope everyone has a good evening.